good afternoon. I want to welcome you to our 2020-2021 uh, session of rounds, our, our health economics and health technology assessment rounds um, as part of the uh, NOAA series of events. Uh, before we get started, I want to bring your attention to some other NOAA events that are coming up. Uh, we, will, we have rounds programmed already for October, November, December, and January. I encourage you to register in advance for those on our website. We also have the Alberta Health Economics Study Group coming up on October 2nd. Um, it will be virtual this year online, and we have a really good lineup for that. We also have a networking event planned for October 1st um, from 4 to 5 p.m. the evening before that takes the place of the dinner that we usually have with the study group, but we won't be having this year. It will have some rotating sessions and offer a chance to connect with different mentors associated with different subject matter and areas of expertise. Um, and I encourage everyone to register if you have not already for study group, and we will be sending out more information about the networking event. Um, we also are going to be shortly announcing the NOAA awards for this year. Um, this includes the internship and fellowship, where we take um, one intern and one fellow each from University of Calgary and University of Alberta. Applications for those will be opening in the next couple weeks. There's already a website up off the NOAA webpage with a little bit of information. And if you have um, acquaintances or students, depending on you know your role in the community, uh, I encourage you to point people towards that as an opportunity. Uh, the appointments will start in January. So if you know a student who will be working on a master's thesis or ready to do a postdoc in around January, please point them our way. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Um, she is from out of province and we're very lucky to have her. Stephanie Harvard is a Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research postdoctoral research fellow at the University of British Columbia. She received her PhD in population and public health in a joint program between the University of BC and Université Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris. Um, she is building on a background in cost effectiveness modeling, but with a focus of understanding the role of social, ethical, and other values in scientific modeling to ensure that health economics models are informed by patient and public values, which I think is a really cool topic. And so, I would say please join me in welcoming, but you're all on mute, so you can't, uh, Stephanie, to our, our round session today. Just by way of logistics, um, we will take questions at the end. The webinar software has a questions box where you can type your question as it occurs to you, and Nicole will hop on the line and help you know uh, smooth the logistics on getting those questions answered at the end. And with that, I will hand it over to Stephanie. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. I really wish that I could see your smiling faces and, and confirm that you exist, but I'm just gonna have to take a, a leap of faith. Uh, thank you to Nicole and to Kate, and thank you to all of you for having me. I'm very excited and honored to, to be here today. Um, I'm gonna try to advance my slide here, but it's not gonna work for me. There we go, okay. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about a project called the Peer Models Network, and I want to acknowledge that we've received funding from three different sources. First, the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, uh, the BC Academic Health Science Network, and also the BC Support Unit, which is responsible for um, advocating patient-oriented research here in, in BC. The project is co-led by myself, as well as Mohsen Sadat Safavi and uh, Amina Dibi, who are both uh, with me at UBC Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Um, we have two patient partners on this project who are Allison McLean and Don Grant. And we also have collaborators from the UBC Sauter School of Business, that's Greg Worker, and also D uh, David Murphy, who's at the SFU School of Communication. So before we get started, I just want to pay my respects to the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, I'm coming at you here today from their unceded homelands. And we're a group of health economists, so let's take a moment to reflect on the fact that health disparities do exist because of colonization and white supremacy. Um, as well as today, I'm gonna to be talking uh, about ideas from academic health economics, as well as philosophy of science. And these are both fields that put up barriers to people of color and are dominated by white people. Um, 
this talk today is going to raise some practical questions that are going to need answers. And those answers will reflect the values of people that answer them. So my own values include anti-racism and justice, and I hope that these are some core values that we can keep in mind today throughout the discussion. So to get started with some context, uh, as an audience of health economists knows very well, healthcare decisions are often informed by scientific models. So this includes statistical and simulation models that inform decisions around resource allocation in the health system. There is growing demand for model transparency. Now, to respond to this demand, our team has launched a pilot project, which is called the Peer Models Network, or the PMN for short. Now, the PMN centers around a software that's called the Programmable Interface for Statistical and Simulation Models, or PRISM. And this was developed by Mohsen and Amin. And this platform makes models publicly available and accessible online on a cloud. And with APIs, it allows users with different levels of technical experience to interact with models. Now, in addition to direct access to models, the Peer Models Network hosts a range of educational resources that are meant to help explain modeling and related concepts. So one thing that this includes is educational videos um, in different styles that we call model companion videos. In addition to videos, we have blog posts that include things like interviews with modelers discussing the modeling process, as well as interviews with stakeholders like patient partners. Finally, the Peer Models Network invites visitors to the site to give feedback on models or videos, other materials, using a few different mechanisms. So first of all, there's a web query form where people can send private messages, and there's also a public uh, online discussion forum. Visitors are also all invited to join what we call the Peer Models Network panel. So this is an email listserv of people who wish to participate in formal evaluation efforts. So now that you know the context for this talk, I want to just share the outline for the rest of it. So first, I want to back up and discuss the issue of transparency. So first, I'm going to go over how some influential health economists are talking about transparency. And then I want to go over how some influential philosophers of science are talking about it. And this will lead into a discussion about maybe what needs to go along with transparency and give me a chance to summarize the theory and the goals the design of the PMN. So after that, I hope we'll have a, a time for discussion. So in my opinion, in the world of health economics, to speak of transparency is to speak of the ISPOR SMDM statement on model transparency and validation. Now, this statement gives a very specific view of transparency and validation. So for ISPOR SMDM, transparency is about enabling review of a model structure, equations, parameter values, and assumptions. It's not about the formulation or the conduct or the results of an analysis. And they see transparency as having two goals. The first of which is really a general understanding among possibly a lay audience. And then the second is a deeper understanding among a scientific audience with the possibility of replication. So one of the goals of my presentation today is just to flag that this is not the only possible view of transparency. Now, in particular, ISPOR SMDM views transparency in conjunction with validation. And my opinion is that there's a good reason for doing this, and I agree with it. Um, and they make what I think is a good note that both transparency and validation are needed for, for users to have confidence in a model. But their specific view of validation is something that I want to discuss. Now, in particular, they make a reference to the possibility of models being correct and to the idea that, you know, what ultimately matters is whether a model replicates reality. So I wanna come back to this. So just to give some examples of recent discourse on transparency in health economics, I've included a few references here from different Western contexts. Uh, the Carlson, Kent, and Samson groups are recent articles on transparency. And these groups have all expressed their views relative to is uh, ISPOR SMDMs. And they've focused on discussing what transparency means or what it should mean in practice and on analyzing the risks and benefits of different answers to that question. 
So to me, this discourse makes it very clear that our goals and our priorities, our values are really central to conversations on transparency and health economics. So of the three articles that I've highlighted, I think the most systematic consideration of transparency is the Samson groups. And they address the what, why, who, and how of transparency. I think theirs is a very useful discussion. So I want to review it here in some detail. And where the Carlson or Kent groups have raised uh, maybe a distinct issue or they've just used a slightly different term, I'll make a note of that. So beginning with the what of transparency, the Samson group flags several different options. The first is model registries. So the idea of having it be public information, what models are planned, uh, which ones are underway, or maybe which ones are completed, but they're not yet reported in the literature. The second option they flag is reporting guidelines. So things like the Cheers checklist, which lay down standards about what specific information should be disclosed in reports about models. A third option is reference models, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. These are models that focus on giving a comparatively complete representation of a system or a target. So something like a disease process. Um, and these are models that are based on particularly comprehensive evidence reviews. And possibly most importantly, reference models are typically understood as being developed without any particular decision uh, problem in mind. So to me, a really interesting question is, why exactly are reference models considered to be a mechanism for transparency? Uh, Samson Group, uh, their opinion is that it's because reference models separate the model building activity from specific applications. So my opinion is that this separation actually gets at something that's uh, related to transparency, but maybe a bit different. So this is another thing that I want to come back to. So just some additional options for manifestations of, of transparency and modeling. Open source models are a big one, of course. This means things like direct access to data, to code, to models themselves, uh, possibly online interfaces that where users can change model parameters and so on. Um, another possible what of transparency is peer review, particularly if this is adapted in more or one or more ways uh, from the current system. The Sanson Group makes a, a note that there's a relationship between transparency and peer review, and I think this makes a lot of sense. You know, the, the more information that's made publicly available, the more people can review it. Finally, uh, they talk about the idea of collaboration. So multi-stakeholder sort of networks uh, in terms of modelers with interests in specific fields, specific areas, having things like conferences to compare results and so on. So moving on to the why. So in other words, purposes, goals, and so on. One possible reason would be for us to improve our productivity. So for example, making models publicly available could minimize duplication or it could minimize uh, overlapping modeling efforts in the, in the very same area. Another major reason would be something like what the Samson Group calls rigor. So concepts like, can we reduce how many errors we make? Can we ensure that model inputs are appropriate? And can we facilitate validation, whatever we understand validation to mean? Finally, another reason to pursue transparency is something like accountability. So on this item, different groups tend to use different terms and concepts. So I've put in blue font some that the Carlson and, and Kent groups mention. But this why item basically has to do with who is accountable and who is credited for what. And how does this link to things like trust and user confidence in the model? Uh, the last few concepts that pop up, things like general understanding, innovation, better decisions, these are all terms that pop up in the literature and, and probably fit into the Samson Group framework somewhere. So the next idea that they develop has to do with who are the players in increasing transparency in health economics. And I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to point out that the Samson Group uh, thinks about this in terms of several specific stakeholders in the healthcare space, and then they think about wider society under its own header. And then under that header, the next distinction that's often made is between patients and the public. Now, the last thing that the Samson Group reviews is the how. 
So how can we go about increasing transparency in health economics? They start with the idea of removing barriers. Uh, they mention things like legal, legal barriers, which they think affect uh, industry players possibly the most. Software barriers uh, flag the idea that maybe certain software is more or less easy to understand, more or less easy to be tra transparent with and use collaboratively. Uh, for me, the most interesting barrier that they mention is the knowledge barrier. So the fact that there's really only limited, very specific guidance about making models transparent right now. So this is something that I'll come back to as well. Beyond removing barriers, they discuss the idea of incentives. So how can we promote transparency? Uh, how can we make incentives for making models open source? Uh, they mention the idea of financial compensation, uh, so for modelers directly, but possibly they mention, you know, we need a shift in culture. So a shift in credit uh, and the expectations uh, for modelers uh, in a way that would promote transparency. They also discuss incentives for users. So what are the incentives for actually using open models? And here the issue that they raise is quality assurance. So in other words, people will be incentivized to use open models uh, just if they're confident in their quality. So this suggests that maybe systems need to be put in place around model validation. Finally, their last how item has to do with establishing infrastructure. So one idea that they come up with is mandates. So for example, in lieu of providing incentives, modelers could actually be obliged to make models transparent. And, and the folks that would have the power to do this would be uh, agencies like HTA agencies, CADAS, and, and so on. They also talk about platforms. So things like online tools suitable for sharing model code and documentation. So the Peer Models Network is a very good example of this very sort of infrastructure. And last but not least, the Samson Group discusses the need to establish stakeholder networks, you know, to bring together all of the players that stand to have different goals and concerns around model transparency. And I think that here they make a very good point that an ongoing and open discussion is going to be needed here because there are risks and benefits to doing things differently uh, in the context of transparency, and people are going to have different views on this. Uh, in terms of risks, I haven't detailed them all here um, just because of time constraints, but some of the more obvious ones are for the, uh, the potential for models to be sort of quote unquote misused or used in a way they aren't intended or possibly for folks to feel like they were robbed of their intellectual property. Okay, so just to give a few thoughts of my own about the current discourse on transparency and health economics. Um, first, there is some talk about how the definition of transparency is debated. And I would just make the very simple point that I don't think it's so much the definition that's being debated as much as it's the norms that are being debated. So what we're really debating is how can we establish norms or standards of practice that are relevant to a particular cluster of goals. And I definitely agree with the Samson group that norms are gonna have to be established at least in terms of what, why, who, and how. Uh, but I think the why is a particularly important one to linger on, since establishing norms is intrinsically linked to what we're trying to achieve. So for every what, for every who, for every how, we can ask the question why, and we can also ask the question why not? Why would we maybe not do something a certain way? So that's a simple point, but I just want to definitely flag that it is a conversation about our values. And this raises the next very important question to me, which is, at what level do we want to be establishing norms based on shared values? So one idea is that uh, a body like ISPOR SMDM establishes norms for the entire field based on values shared among the people involved in ISPOR SMDM. And I think it's clear that there are some disadvantages to that. Um, another idea would be to establish one or more sets of norms at different levels. So for example, at the provincial level. And those are just some ideas. Uh, Last, I think an important question to ask is what information do people need in order to make decisions around establishing norms? Now, establishing norms is a, pro a process of making value judgments. And it's, it's understood that our values and our, our value judgments are shaped by the information that we have at hand. So we might find ourselves favoring different sets of norms if we have different information available to us in terms of different risks and benefits 
So this is the segue into the next section of my talk, which is about the discourse on transparency within the philosophy of science. Because philosophers of science uh, tend to raise slightly different issues, or at least structure the discussion in a slightly different way, which I think leaves us with different ideas to consider. Okay, so a philosopher of science who is very active in thinking about transparency is Kevin Elliott at Michigan State. And he makes a very useful observation in a recent paper of his, um, which is that scientists, uh, perhaps most emblematically those in the open science movement, tend to talk most frequently about making data and methods transparent, publicly available and so on. Um, but philosophers of science talk most frequently about making value judgments transparent. And what they tend to mean is more than just making a value judgments publicly available. They tend to mean making value judgments understandable and clear in their implications. So for philosophers of science, transparency is actually a precondition for managing the value ladenness of science. And it's in this respect that the transparency discourse in philosophy of science is really embedded in the discourse around scientific objectivity. And conversations around scientific objectivity overlap with conversations about trustworthiness and legitimacy in science and so on. So these are concepts that pop in and out of how different people understand what scientific objectivity is. So a very standard reference in philosophy will tell us that scientific objectivity is a characteristic of things in science. So it's a characteristic of claims, methods, and results, and so on. And a core idea is that, you know, these shouldn't be influenced by our value commitments or by bias, et cetera. And finally, a key concept in objectivity conversations is that objectivity is an ideal. So it's a reason that we should value scientific knowledge. Um, it's the basis for the authority that science has in society. But to move on to another really good way of saying what's at issue here when we talk about objectivity, uh, the philosopher Elizabeth Lloyd says that objectivity is about truth and how to get at it. Um, but she observes that there's four different basic ways that people use this term, and they're all a little bit different. So first of all, objectivity can mean something like being disinterested or being unbiased. It can also mean something like being publicly available or observable. Um, third, it can have a more metaphysical meaning, so something like existing separately from humans, something like being mind independent. And finally, it can mean something like referring to the single true reality, so the really real or the, the way things really are. So from Lloyd's work and from other philosophers engaging with Lloyd's work and working in that space, uh, going back to Kevin Elliott, he draws out different criteria that maybe we can use to determine whether something is objective. And we can see here that transparency is just one of the potential criteria. So I think this is a good example just of how the conversation around transparency in philosophy is embedded in this conversation around objectivity. Now, Eliot eventually argues in favor of three criteria for objectivity that are, that are actually useful in practice. And he actually argues that there's one in particular that's very useful. So I just wanna go through quickly first and see which ones he does away with as being not that useful or not useful at all. So first, he does away with this criterion of having to exist independently from us or be really real. And the reason that he gives for doing this is that whether or not something is really real is just not under the control of the scientist. So it doesn't give guidance for how to promote objectivity. Um, but I think another way of putting it would be to say something like, well, even if we want uh, knowledge to be about something really real, or even if we think it needs to be about something really real to be objective, we still have to figure out what we think is, is needed to establish that realness. So this criterion is not helpful on its own. Um, Eliot does away with the criterion of manipulability for a similar reason. He says it's not in the control of scientists whether something is manipulable. So we can do away with those. Now, the next criterion that Elliot does away with is the criterion that investigators have to be uh, unbiased or value neutral. And he himself in the article does this very quickly by simply saying and referencing that very few philosophers of science today really believe that this is possible. But I've, I've placed a chili pepper here 
because I know that many people, particularly in health economics, uh, still strongly f uh, favor this criterion. So let's just review a little bit more in depth why philosophers tend to do away with it. So the idea that scientists should be unbiased or value-free is often referred to as the value-free ideal for science. Uh, there's no single place in the literature that this is written down, so you see different interpretations of it. But what it generally means, or has meant in the last 40 years, is that certain values are unacceptable in certain phases of, of science. So the sometimes forbidden values are the social, the ethical, the political, religious type values, which in philosophy are called non-epistemic values. And the stages where those values are forbidden are the so-called internal phases of science. Now, it's also debatable what that means. What's the internal phase of science? Um, but we can converge on one answer, which is that it definitely seems to include evaluating evidence or appraising hypotheses, so deciding what's true. That tends to be regarded as an internal phase of science where we shouldn't be using our, our values, our non-epistemic values. Um, and that stage, that forbidden stage, definitely doesn't include things like picking the topic to study. Effectively, everybody agrees you use your values when you pick the, the topic to study because it's a straightforward determination of what's important. So now that we have an idea of what the value free, free ideal suggests, uh, I'll go through what are four really major challenges to it. And these come from numerous philosophers over many decades. I'm gonna go through them quickly, but if you want more detail, they're all in this, this article here, which I'll reference again. Um, so to go through the arguments quickly here, the first argument is sometimes called the, the gap argument. And it basically says, you know, scientists have to make some assumptions in their work. And it's these assumptions that end up reflecting our social values. And a good example of this from health economics is, you know, the idea, the assumption that quality of life can be modeled on a scale from zero to one or zero to 10 using death as the lower anchor. The next argument is somewhat similar. Um, it's called the error argument or the inductive risk argument. And this basically just points out that scientists have to decide when is there enough evidence to make a claim? When is there enough evidence to say that something is the case? And to do this, we have to consider the consequences of being wrong. So to do this, we have to use our ethical values. For people with, with you know, health economics experience or clinical experience, I think there's a straightforward analogy here to false positives and false negatives. It depends on the context, which one is worse. So it's your basic sensitivity uh, specificity question or your type one versus type two error question. Uh, third, the boundary argument points out that there's no clear difference really between scientific and social values. This is the argument. Um, so for example, if you think of the various choices that are required in the scientific process, like how do we categorize things? Uh, the argument basically says it's hard to prove that any of those choices were made just for scientific reasons. Uh, finally, the cascade argument points out, well, the value-free ideal lets us use our values when we're picking the topic to study, right? We're allowed to use them in the very early phase of study, but then these value judgments have a cascade effect, a domino effect, throughout the entire process. So the fact that the ideal allows these is problematic. You can't uphold the ideal. So an example in health economics would be something like, you know, very legitimately, the research question would affect your model structure. But then there's evidence to suggest that the model structure can affect the results uh, of, your, of your model. So that's the cascade argument in a nutshell. So I recently did a study in the Vancouver area with health economists uh, there were 22 participants in this study where we went through all of these arguments in detail and we asked people about whether they had examples from practice about um, social and ethical value judgments being required in the modeling process. So um, I'll let this reference out uh, sort of later. Anybody can have a copy of this article for more detail. But just to give one example, here is a quote from a participant who raises a uh, an example of a conundrum that draws on our social values in the modeling process. So basically the participant is saying, look, I've got data uh, I could use from three different studies, but only one of those studies includes data on ethnicity. 
So I've got one option, which is to use all three studies, but then I can't use the variable ethnicity, or I can kick out two of the studies and just use the one study that has ethnicity in order to keep it. And you know, how do you choose? So that's an example of the type of conundrum that um, can actually be interpreted with one or more of those arguments. Okay, so not too much time to go deep into that today, but at the same time, um, it's an overview of why philosophers of science uh, largely generally have moved past the value-free ideal. Now, in its place, they look for an alternative. And one of the most influential alternatives comes out of the work of Helen Longineau. Now, Longineau herself refers to the alternatives she suggests as contextual empiricism. But a more explicit label for it uh, is the social value management ideal, or the SVMI. And this is by no means the only alternative that philosophers have come up with, but most of the alternatives that I'm aware of have a lot in common with it, um, and they're compatible with it in one or more ways. So the SVMI can be summarized in a key claim, which is that science is objective to the degree that it permits transformative criticism. So what is transformative criticism? Um, and I should just note that in both of Longino's works, uh, transformative criticism is sometimes referred to as transformative interrogation. So those are sort of uh, synonyms in that context. So what exactly is transformative criticism? Longino argues for four different components. First, we're gonna need public venues for criticism. So we need to have public forums where folks can critique the various elements of research. Second, that criticism is going to have to be uptaken. So scientists need to respond to criticism to their work in the, in the form of transformations in their data, their methods, the reasons for doing things, the arguments that they advance for, for claims and so on. And these transformations should reflect the fact that you know, the criticism was received. Third, public standards are required. And the reason is to define what criticism is relevant, there need to be shared standards. And these standards can be criticized uh, and transformed themselves over time, but a shared standard is effectively necessary for a scientific community to work together. Finally, Longino talks about what she calls tempered equality of intellectual authority. But what this point basically gets at is that criticism is most effective when it's carried out from diverse perspectives. So criticism is not particularly effective if a group of very similarly positioned, very like-minded people do it together. So to encourage this type of criticism from diverse angles, a certain equality needs to be granted among members of a community. And her basic proposal is that we allow for acknowledging domain-specific knowledge, but we also grant an equality for critical discussion among all members. So an example here in health economics would be, you know, we grant that health economists have certain domain-specific knowledge, you know, we know how to calculate qualities and so on, but we also grant that there are many non-health economists that have an equal capacity for critical discussion around resource allocation. So this allows us to hear from people that are not health economists. Okay, so in terms of the reception of this, of this alternative, this is a highly influential account of an alternative ideal in science. And it features centrally in conversations that are happening right now around scientific objectivity. Um, it does raise various important questions that have not been answered. So for example, how many perspectives have to be heard for science to be objective? Um, exactly which perspectives are we talking about? Uh, when we talk about intellectual authority, how exactly does the equality need to look? Um, how exactly should authority be distributed between scientists and non-scientists? And uh, finally, if we're going to talk about things being subject to democratic approval, that seems obviously unwieldy and problematic. So exactly what needs to be subject to democratic approval? Who needs to be involved? Under what conditions? And so on. So those are questions that continue to be debated today. But one idea is that even before we can answer those questions, there are reasons to pursue the SVMI or something similar to the SVMI um, because on its face, it's something that promotes trust. 
So it's possible that it's worthwhile to pursue this ideal even before we've figured out all the answers, just because we have an intuition that this is something that people will find to be more trustworthy if they can see what's going on. So to me, that view is a bit similar to some of the discourse in, on transparency and health economics, because I get a sense that most people agree, we really don't know exactly what we're talking about yet. We don't know exactly what we think or what we should do, but we do have an intuition that transparency is gonna promote trust. So just to return briefly, briefly to Eliot's criteria for objectivity, what he ultimately argues are that there are certain criteria that are just not helpful, but other ones can be grouped together. So the final three that he chooses are transparency, reproducibility, and effective criticism. So effective criticism can group various things that are proposed by various philosophers. And his conclusion ultimately is that transparency has limitations on its own. And so does reproducibility. We all know certain problems with re reproducibility. As much as we don't want to throw it out, um, you know, we can't necessarily say that we're going to have the funds to reproduce every single study and so on. Um, so on, the, on their own, those two are limited. So Eliot argues that the gaps there need to be made up for with effective criticism. So he notes that effective criticism is the most powerful criterion that we have um, when we're deciding how to designate something as objective. So moving on to Eliot's recent work in transparency itself. So addressing transparency directly. Eliot has a framework where he talks about eight different dimensions. And here, we'll actually go through them. We've got the purpose, the audience, the content in terms of what exactly is being shared, the time frame. So when exactly are we starting this, this transparency process? Uh, we've got different actors involved, po different possible mechanisms for transparency, uh, venues for transparency, and then finally dangers. So what are the risks involved in transparency and, and different ways of manifesting it? So here, I think it's obvious there's a lot of overlap with the proposal by the Samson group, um, but at the same time, some important nuances that we maybe don't see in health economics quite yet. And in particular, I put a star there uh, on content, because I, I think we see a focus in philosophy of science that we don't see in health economics yet, which has to do with declaring value judgments and declaring the implications of, of value judgments. Um, so, for example, in health economics, I think often we hear that we should report our assumptions. And one possibility is that that's code for report your value judgments. Um, but if that's what we mean, then possibly a step forward would be, would be to be more explicit and to say, you know, report your value judgments. Um, I also think we possibly could place more emphasis on, on the need to understand the value judgments we're, ma we're making, uh, to disclose the social values that are informing specific models and also being open about their implications. And I said I wanted to return to this idea of reference models as a, as a mechanism for transparency. And you know, my own interpretation is sort of that reference models are maybe more of a mechanism for managing value judgments. Um, you know, this idea of separating the, the question from the process, I think possibly this is a mechanism that we would think of as reducing the risk that Models are going to make specific choices that favor a specific result or a specific outcome when answering a, a particular decision problem. So that's a potential discussion point. Um, the other element that I don't think we see too, too much yet in health economics is the concept of collaborating with communities as a mechanism for transparency. We do see, of course, patient and public engagement in HTA. Um, but I think this is a bit different from collaboration throughout the modeling process. Um, this is something that's emerging within the patient-oriented research paradigm. So that has started off this practice of involving patients and the public uh, throughout the modeling process. Um, but it is sort of a new thing. And I think that something that's interesting to think about is how patient-oriented research itself is possibly or could be a mechanism not only for transparency, but for effective criticism of research. Uh, within a framework like the SDMI. Okay, so just to go back now and recap and summarize the theoretical foundation for the design of the PMN. Um, the Peer Models Network basically understands transparency 
as a precondition for objective science. So both in the sense that transparency is going to be required for replication, but also because it's going to be required for effective criticism, particularly of value judgments. And I should note that this view of transparency, I don't think it's all that different from is for smdms view, because they also see transparency as being important, not just by itself, but in combination with validation. But I think that we should note that is for smdms view of validation faces challenges both by health economists and particularly by philosophers of science. So to name just a few, you know, they have this, this view, and I realize that's an old article, it's from 2012, um, so possibly they've moved on, but it's still an article that's sort of in circulation. And they do put down this view that ultimately what matters is whether a model accurately predicts what occurs in reality. And to name a few problems with this view, you know, not all models are used for prediction, not all model predictions are ever compared to observed events. If a model has predicted something well in the past, it doesn't prove it'll predict something well in the future. Um, models generally don't predict with perfect accuracy. So we still have to establish exactly how accurate predictions need to be. And all of that is without even getting into our metaphysical questions about, you know, what is reality? Is there a single true reality and so on? So uh, in the philosophy of modeling, the leading account of model validation is what they call adequacy for purpose. And I don't have time to get into this view in detail here today, but it's reasonably similar to the view that's described by, I don't know how to pronounce this name, so apologies to those who do. Uh, it's Vemir or Vemmer. Um, this is a health economist group that challenges is for SMDM's definition of validation. And you know what they argue is that, uh, that model validation should be understood as whether a model is a proper and sufficient representation of a system um, in view of a specific application. So that view is not that different from the one in, in philosophy of science, although it, it is a little bit different. And I would still argue that the adequacy for purpose view in the philosophy of modeling is a, it gets around certain other other problems that we run into. So, for example, some people are familiar with models that purposely misrepresent. Um, and that leads us to some problems with even the Vermeer Group's um, definition. So long story short, that's an area that I'm, I'm quite interested in in terms of model validation, and it's uh, a conversation that's really relevant to conversations about transparency and effective criticism, because we do need to root ourselves in what we understand uh, a valid model to be. So now that we have gone over the theory behind the PMN, I just want to quickly review its design. So one thing that's obvious that it, it aims to be a public venue for criticism. So the site enables direct access to models and to documentation. Uh, moving forward, if we have stakeholder support, we easily could add more explicit information about value judgments and analysis of implications of value judgments. Um, the site supports the collection of feedback through various online mechanisms. And we do aim to support the uptake of that criticism. So in the pilot phase, any feedback we receive, we will forward to developers. Um, sometimes we get the question, well, who decides ultimately who needs to, to uptake the criticism and you know, or whether it should be taken? And you know, the answer is definitely the decisions rest with the primary research team. And I think that there are very good reasons for doing it that way. But of course, it does underscore that we then would have to probably think about you know diversity in research teams and whether we can have effective mechanisms for criticism even within research teams. So finally in terms of this temperate equality of intellectual authority, um, oh I'm actually not going to advance yet, so temperate equality of intellectual authority is the type of thing where we talk about engaging different audiences and so the PMN tries to do that by producing videos and other resources that talk to people who are not health economists. And the idea there is that, you know, people are in, are capable of engaging in critical discussion about health economics, but the field has made little effort to engage with them. It's a very closed system right now. So, Longino's last point has to do with shared standards. And this is something that we've not been able to address in the pilot phase. And I think for a very good reason, because we're talking about establishing norms and that's something that needs to be done with a much broader community, but it is going to be a very important part uh, moving forward. So basically, the goals of the PMN project right now are to promote conversation, to promote conversation and debate about the many different dimensions of transparency and how we can understand it, and to work towards 
establishing new norms for health economics um, that take into consideration, you know, not just transparency in isolation, but the role of effective criticism and, you know, competing and more recent views of model validity. And for me, the next steps uh, that are major are going to have to do with figuring out you know, how to promote this discussion, how to engage people in the discussion. So I'm going to leave it there since I'm out of time. If anyone would like references, please let me know. They're all available to you. And I would just like to say once again, thank you so much to our funders and uh, our collaborators. And I will leave it off there. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So we have five questions in the queue. I'm just going to assign the first one. It's from Dr. Marshall. And if you wouldn't mind reading it aloud for the rest of us, that would be very helpful. Okay. The question says, thank you, Stephanie. Pleased that you have found the Samson framework helpful to move forward. What are your thoughts about who and how could be the organizing body, organization to facilitate model transparency in the Canadian and international context? Thank you so much, Dr. Marshall. I appreciate that uh, question a lot. So my first thought on that question would be, I think we have to start uh, by acknowledging that there are, and I don't think anybody, just this is not a controversial statement, everybody recognizes that there are a lot of stakeholders and that they're clustered into their own groups. And I think that it would be really helpful to honor that right out of the gate, um, to honor how people are already assembling and to come out of the gate saying, I don't think anybody has the one answer here or you know, maybe a privileged position, but to ask folks, um, you know, what are your views on these various issues? And maybe even to raise the question of, for you, what are the key questions? Um, so I think I'm, to some extent, maybe sidestepping your questions, you kind of, I'm not pointing a finger at any specific groups. Um, but I think, you know, we, we all know the, the major players that are already on the scene. So I think, um, you know, organizations, if we want to speak in terms of, of organizations, there's CADETH, there's ISPRES and DM. Uh, there are the major university health economics departments. These are all existing organizations. But I think I would try to push us, you know, push us, ourselves to think about maybe what are some groups that have reasons to care about these issues a lot, but they're, they're not currently maybe organized in the way that we immediately recognize. So for example, right now, you know, we've seen a lot of conversation about, um, you know, anti-racist data collection and the pressing need to move forward with more anti-racist, um, you know, actions in terms of what data, not only do, what data do we collect, but who exactly is collecting it. So those are stakeholders that I think would be very important to participate. Um, and I think I could go on and on there in terms of, you know, there are folks who are very much affected by the modeling process in a downstream way because of health resource allocation. So I think that I would take the approach of identi identifying people that have been underserved, um, that would have, you know, good reason to participate in these discussions and to go from there. So uh, shall I move on to the next question in the service of, of time or shall I continue to ramble? I can't see anybody's human faces, so I can't read the room. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Stephanie, I have sent you the second question from Thomas. Okay. If we have recently published, oh, thank you, by the way, Thomas, for this question, or Dr. Lang. If we have recently produced a health economic model which has been published in a peer reviewed journal, how would one go about submitting that model to the Peer Models Network repository? Is there an open submission process? Thank you very much for that question. The answer is yes, there is a totally open submission process. Um, so, one way to get in touch with us is through the website directly. You can use a direct, um, you know, the, the query form, um, or you can email me, or you can email Mosin. Um, the only limitation that we have right now in terms of putting models up has to do with, of course, capacity. It's not, um, you know, free or magical, you know, the process of putting models up, but we're very eager to get as many models up as possible. And I think there's definitely a function here where, like, the more demand that we have, the more engagement, the more eager folks are to put models on the site, then I think that's how the process, um, you know, goes. And that's how we can attract more funding, more support. So definitely do get in touch with us. Anybody here who has an interest in putting a model up, um, you can get in touch with me by email or, or by the website. Okay, so another question from Dr. Marshall. Stephanie, what is your perspective of the benefits and dangers using the eight dimensions of transparency? Do the benefits outweigh the harms? Under what circumstance might the dangers uh, outweigh the benefits? So 
that's definitely um, an extremely complex question. And I would want to say first off that I don't think my answer would be particularly important. Um, you know, you it would reflect my own tolerance for risk, my own tolerance or my own appreciation of different benefits. Um, so I'm very happy to give my own view, um, but I just wouldn't I wouldn't want to overstate its importance. I think that these are assessments that we have to do in, within communities. Um, so for for me personally, you know, I tend to err on the side of you know let it out there, be more transparent. I'm someone that um, I don't. I don't sort of privilege the values of like intellectual property more than I privilege the value of letting stakeholders and communities whose you know, live, you know, lives and health are gonna be impacted by these decisions. I, I do think it, for me, um, the, the way to err on that question is with letting people have information about what's happening. Um, so for example, the, the notion of redacting things, I don't tend to take uh, too kindly to. At the very least, I would wanna see the really good reasons. Um, and same thing with in terms of models being misused, for me, um, and this is part of a, a current paper that I have under review, um, something that I think should be explored is we understand that risks happen in the world and sometimes there is just good reason to have them, okay, we're, we're just going to take that risk, but there's things that we can do to mitigate them. So the idea of models being misused, and I'll just give a simple and possibly idealized example here. Um, if we talk more and more about the role of effective criticism, I think we have reason to think that the risk of model misuse could at least be in part mitigated. Because the idea, for example, that someone's model is gonna be taken and then someone's gonna you know, input a bunch of really inappropriate parameter values, values that obviously skew the model in favor, maybe in favor of a particular intervention or so on, I think that some of that can be mitigated with safe background conditions. So the more people understand the role of you know, effective criticism, the more people understand, okay, well, yeah, if you use that set of parameter values, it's very clear that it's gonna come out this way. And here, you know, if we have mechanisms to sort of um, educate people and have more understanding about the implications of doing things one way or the other, particularly at the organizational level, I think that we can mitigate some of that. Um, but I hope that that's a, uh, can be regarded as a baby steps, small version of the answer. Because like I said, I think risk benefit conversations really have to be taken quite care carefully. And I would like people to debate me, you know, because I think my values would be, would be changed by other information, you know, from a model developer's perspective. I think that they probably have insights that I, that I don't have in terms of maybe where the risks are honestly too great. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is that because there's these eight different dimensions, I think it's gonna take us a lot of work to think about how those dimensions interact with each other. You know, we all know that different people who do DCEs here will probably relate to this. Like, you know, if you introduce different attributes, different, you know, levels to the decision problem, things can come out quite differently. So I think we're gonna to have to accept that when we see those eight different dimensions in different combinations, we can get a different result in terms of whether we think the risks outweigh the harms or not. So yeah, long rambly answer to a question I think ultimately is just extremely complex. Thanks, Stephanie. So there's just one more question um, okay. and I've passed it your way from Daniel Wagner. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and Daniel says, I'm interested in your distinctions between transparency and reproducibility suggested that a transparent model is reproducible. Uh, well, I wouldn't say always, I wouldn't say always. I think it's, um, I think transparency, first of all, would be um, a precondition for reproducibility. I don't think it's a sort of both necessary and sufficient condition. Um, is the reverse true? The second part of the question is, is the reverse true? Should one expect a reproducible model to be transparent and to who? So, yeah, I mean, I think that there is an interrelationship there. I mean, so first, the first thing that I would say is, I mean, it's pretty hard to understand how you would re reproduce. I mean, usually I think of reproducibility in the context of, okay, so there's a group of scientists that have produced a representation of something. I'd like to produce the same representation. I don't know how I'm going to do that unless I have an idea of what they did. So to me, that is transparency in that sense of um, it's accessible and observable to me. So to me, that's the relationship there. Um, and then 
should I expect a reproducible model to be transparent and then to who? I would say I, I would expect it to be transparent in the sense that's required for me to convince people that in fact I reproduced it. And when you say to who, I would say, um, and this connects actually to this adequacy for, for purpose view that I was referencing, which is, well, who, who do you care that you convince reproduced your model? And this can sound, I think, sometimes as relativistic, but it's not relativistic in any problematic sense. It's relative, you know, it's it's a question that's relative to the agents that are involved in in modeling and to the questions that you're trying to answer. And that's not a understood in my opinion in the literature to be a uh, problematic form of relativism. You know, modeling really is an agent rooted process. And so it's okay to talk about who is involved and it's okay to talk about what questions we're trying to answer. So my answer would be yes, I would expect a reproducible model to be transparent and I would say it needs to be transparent to the degree that's necessary to accomplish my goal, which is if I've reproduced something, presumably my goal is to take meaning from the fact that it was reproducible. So typically in science, I think most of us would agree that we, we take a cue when something is reproducible, that it's probably something closer to the, to the uh, a truth that we care about. So reproducibility is a, it's an epistemic value basically. Um, and then again, yeah, so to who? I think it matters to you. You're gonna have to pick um, who it needs to be transparent to. Another rambly answer. It's quite funny giving answers to my own computer without seeing any humans. I'm gonna cross my fingers that at least one of you is smiling and that you're not all <laughs> eye rolling. Uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone's having a good time. We still have uh, quite a few attendees on the line. Um, okay. So thank you very much, Dr. Harvard, for your thought provoking webinar. Um, just for everyone's awareness, this webinar is going to be publicly available at noaa.ca shortly, along with a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation. So if you want to revisit any of the presentation or listen to the questions again, that will all be available at noaa.ca. Um, please join us for the next NOAA rounds presented by Dr. Venkataramani, who will be speaking about recessions and health in the time of COVID-19 on October 21st at 12 o'clock Mountain Time. And thank you all once again for joining us this afternoon. We hope to see you again. Thank you, everybody.